Hello. My name is Steve Lambert. Um, I was trained as an artist, but I always had some activist tendencies, got embroiled in different things. Um, and about 10 years ago, I met this guy named Steve Duncombe. Um, I was working from the arts and trying to affect power. And Steve was working from the organizing side with the background as a historian and a sociologist. Both of us were kind of skeptical and thought that the other one might have the answers about what really worked. And so we started uh, basically a research project of does creative activism work? And if so, how does it work? What can we learn? The beginning of this, uh, we started looking at history and culture and how history and culture work. And when we started going back, we thought artistic activism is sort of new process, new thing, maybe in the last 10 years. But every time we went back further, we'd find new examples. And what we discovered is that all successful activist movements have artistic elements, right? They use signs, symbols, story, and spectacle. And so we started the Center for Artistic Activism. And the Center for Artistic Activism has worked to move the whole field forward, both through our research, we do education programs with artists and activists, we do the practice, we remain practitioners, and we do consultation and collaboration with on-the-ground groups. At this point, I think we've done um, over 25 or 30 workshops, maybe more, around the world um, with over 1,000 activists, four continents, I think uh, 14 or 15 different countries. There, some of them are listed here. And we work with groups that are working on all kinds of issues. They bring the expertise on the issues, and we bring the expertise around art and activism, and we work together. Um, we've come up with a four or five day curriculum that includes an action. I'm gonna show you an example of one of those actions at the end. Um, and I just wanna let you know if you see, if you're looking closely here, I can talk about this for four to five straight days. So I'm gonna try to keep it to 30 minutes. Um, Okay, so Mushan, if you could help me out and come up here. I, I, I could tell you about the workshop, but I thought it'd be more fun if we do something that we do in the workshop as a quick example. And so what I'm gonna do, I wanna ask you a question and I actually need you to say the answers back and Mushan's gonna write them down. So my question is, I need 10 ways that the world could end by this time next year. So what are 10 ways the world could end by this time next year? Nuclear war, Nuclear war. great. Sorry? A tweet. A tweet. Give, give me more. Uh, what kind of tweet? Not a Trump. Trump tweet. A, a horrible Trump tweet. Let's say a diplomatic disaster. Um, asteroid. Asteroid. An alien attack. A solar flare. Good. What kind of major catastrophe? Water. Oh, a flood. A flood. Great. Did you say flood too? Famine, good. How many do we have? We have one, two, six. We need four more. A virus, that's a good one. Uh, polluted water. Okay. We got alien invasion. AI killer machines. Okay, did we get to 10? I think we got to 10. Okay, great. Now, I'm gonna ask you another question. Same thing, I need answers. So, uh, Mushan, could you flip the, uh, the chart and we're gonna have, we need a fresh piece of paper. Okay, I need 10 ways by this time next year the world could be saved. <laughs> Sorry? Say it clearer. Oh, diversity and inclusion. Okay. That's good. That's a good one. I like that one. Say that again. Renewable energy done by next year. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? Communities? More emphasis on communities. Okay. The point here. Thank you, Mashan. I'm going to cut this off early because, again, I can talk about it for four or five days. Um, this is a lot harder, right? Like, the first thing you did was laugh, and then they come a lot slower, right? Um, there's a reason for this, um, and I, it comes from cognitive science, right? Like, we, are, we have a negativity bias. We have an inclination to imagine disaster. 
it's just how we are. We did this exercise one time with Iraq veterans, and they're like, it's because we're damaged and we're traumatized. It's like, that, yeah, that, that did happen, but this is not why. <laughs> this is true for all humans around the world. Um, and I think that there's an evolutionary argument for it. I think other people have made this argument. And so I want you to imagine, if we could get this slide up here, that we are in a, um, a, a plane a long time ago. A small, we're a small group, right? And we're trying to survive. And we hear off in the distance a rustling in the grass. Now, if I say, guys, I'm pretty sure that rustle is a saber-toothed tiger. We should get out of here. Right? And every time that happens, I'm like, let's go, let's go, it's time to go. Um, we'll survive every time, okay? But say I'm different, you know, I'm from California or something, and, um, and I'm kind of chill, and I'm like, it's a rustle, but we're having a good time. And uh, let's not just take off, right? Let's hang out for a little bit. It's probably a bird. It's probably the wind. And, you know, a lot of times I'd be right, but I only have to be wrong one time and I get eaten, and probably the rest of us get eaten, right? So the point is that we are the descendants of the most paranoid and fearful of our ancestors. And all the super chill, relaxed people are dead. They got eaten, right? <laughs> so this is who we are, right? So why am I talking about this? Because this is important in our workshops because we, it's something we all need to deal with, both as people that make the work but also in the audiences that we're talking to. So, to, to better understand what, how we need to work, we need to understand who, who human beings are. I, uh, in my long and sordid past, was a, I'm a motorcycle rider. I've been riding motorcycles for 20 years. One of the things that they teach you in the motorcycle safety training course is that when you turn, you have to look through the turn, okay? And when, uh, the reason for this is that you need to, they, there's some really beautiful ways they describe it, is when you're looking through the turn, the horizon slows down. The whole landscape slows down. If you're only focused on what's coming in front of you, it, it happens really fast. But if you're looking out there and you're tipping into the turn, you can see the bigger picture, the bigger landscape, right? The saying is, look where you go, go where you look, right? So this guy, coming in really fast into this turn, what often happens, it's happened to me, it's happened to my friends, is you come in and you're like, I'm going fast, look at that big rock, right? And then you start thinking about the rock, and it happens in really, uh, really quickly, right? And it kind of goes like this, it's rock, 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 and then you hit the rock. <laughs> A lot of people get hurt uh, <laughs> this way. And it's called, they, they call it in motorcycling, target fixation, right? And the point is, you do not look at the rock. Don't look at the rock. Look through the turn, right? And you have to train yourself to do this and remind yourself in the turn. Like, as soon as you hear that rock, rock, rock voice, it's like, look through the turn, and, you'll, and most of the time, you can make it. So, clearly, I'm using a metaphor here for activism and how we think about futures. So, uh, here's an example of how I've done this in my practice. We published a newspaper the week after Barack Obama was elected president that outlined the future that could be nine months in the, or a year in the future, I think. So it was a newspaper that looked like the New York Times that had the headlines that we wanted. So instead of the tone of activism being, no, stop, don't, we don't want these things, shut it down, it was like, this is the world that we want, this is how far out it is, and here's the steps that we take to get there, right? Look through the turn, and you'll go where you hopefully get in that direction. Now, the other thing about looking through the turn is uh, it helps you when you see hazards, right? If you're focused on the hazard, you see the rock. That's all you see, and you focus on it. If you look through the turn, you can see paths around the hazard, okay? So these features are really important. Another way that we uh, work with people in our workshops is we tell them, we want you to come up with, now that we have this target out there, um, give me 10, and I'm not asking you now, um, give me 10 ways that we could make this happen, and the first seven need to be impossible, and your last three are possible, right? And so what happens is, and we, what we mean by impossible is uh, too much money, too much time, we don't have enough people, um, it's illegal, it's unethical, violent, like whatever, right? It, uh, it doesn't follow the laws of physics. 
impossible things. And then we want three that are possible. One time I did this and I forgot to say the impossible ones first. Half the group ended up doing, trying to do the possible ones first, the other half tried to do the impossible ones. When I went over to the people that were doing the possible ones first, after like 10 minutes, they had one or two and they were really struggling. And the other group that started with the impossible ones, they'd have like 15, right? Because what happens is they start talking about, well, we could do this, right? We could do this thing. That would be impossible. And someone in the group would say, no, actually, if we did it this way, it would be possible. Put it on the other list. So here's an example of the outcome of that in one of our workshops. Like I said, we do an action at the end. This is uh, the, a group that we worked with in Macedonia. Um, Macedonia is a country in the former Yugoslavia, and they actually there's a, they have a contested name. Um, Greece likes to think that they have the territory of historic Macedonia. So officially, they're called the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, which is a bit cumbersome and nobody there likes it. Um, but that's what it's called. And they're sort of a new country. And there's been this rise in the, uh, around 2010 started um, of nationalism. And part of the form that nationalism took was these statues that went up all over the uh, downtown, literally hundreds of statues. Um, of these historic figures from Macedonia that they would hold up as the heroes. But the other form that the nationalism took was a hostility to LGBTI people. This is Skopje's LGBTI center. And the LGBTI community there was really, they're, they're treated with a lot of hostility. Their pride parades, they would be attacked. And in watching this kind of thing, it's really frustrating to watch. Um, I, I, when I would watch it, would get really upset, sad, but also kind of angry. And I think when anyone is attacking you, a natural response is to fight, want to fight back. Someone yells at you to yell back, to defend yourself. But animosity and public battles between the LGBTI community and people that say they're real Macedonians is not the outcome that we're looking for. In fact, it's counterproductive, right? So one of the impossible ideas that they came up with in our workshop was, let's make a new country, which is impossible, right? Nearly impossible. But we said, oh, okay, we could do this for a day in the park. And so this was part of our new country. We called it the future republic of the former Republic of Macedonia. <laughs> <laughs> we created uh, like a passport to get in the country. The country is based on love, so you see the logo. This is very similar to the Macedonian logo, but we added the heart. And um, th this is really important. All your paperwork in the passport, all your identifying information was to be written in pencil. Um, so you could write your nationality, but you could change it if you wanted. And your gender was a spectrum. And again, in pencil. So if you start feeling differently next week, you can erase it and move it on the spectrum. Um, when you'd enter the country, there was a border guard. The border guard would blow their whistle and announce that you've joined the country, and everyone would applaud. Um, and then you'd come in, and you could become a statue of a hero of our country, right? So you say who you are, and this part says hero or heroine of Macedonia. Um, so this was the biggest and most successful demonstration, and I mean demonstration in the truest sense of the word, right? that the LGBTI community had, had there in years, they told us, right? That it was a demonstration of the world or the country that they wanted. And people could walk in and sort of experience it just for an afternoon in this small scale way. But they could see that this isn't about like this other people coming and invading our country. It's just about living your life and being who you are and being celebrated, right? Everyone, everyone for who they are. Um, we lost count after 600 people joined the country. We ran out of the passports. Um, so this is a very different direction uh, than the, they were inclined to go. Um, and I'm glad to say, and I, I don't know what all contributed to this, but Macedonia has changed a lot in recent years. And I heard a rumor that some of our participants in the workshop are now in government there, so that's nice. Um, 
Again, I'm not taking credit. I don't know what happened, actually. Um, but, uh, and I, I'm going to show you another quick example of this kind of uh, thinking that we do in the workshop and train these activists to do. So um, at the 2016 AIDS conference, the 2016 AIDS conference is a massive conference. It's um, around 15 to 20,000 people. It's the biggest health-related conference in the world. And in the past, sex workers have been excluded because in certain countries, they're considered criminals and they can't get visas. And I was working with sex workers from South Africa, and one of the things they said was the objective they wanted to achieve at the conference was to be talked about in every relevant session, to have a presence there. So this means changing the speeches of people talking or like having them say different things. How do you do that? Um, this is the first evening plenary of, of the AIDS conference. Again, it's like a crowd of about 15,000 people. Um, and the speakers include Nelson Mandela's grandson, um, people that run massive foundations, um, leadership from South Africa. And so we figured out a way. And what we did is we built this sign that says, you've been speaking for, and we would start the clock when the person started speaking. And it would count up. You've been speaking for this long without a mention of sex work, right? And we would just walk around with a sign. Um, the th it was broadcast on national television. And if someone was, in fact, to mention sex work, it folded clothes and said, thank you, right? Um, so we, after about 40 minutes of speakers and nobody mentioning sex work, I kind of had given up, right? Like, we, didn't, we weren't able to change their speeches, but we were able to at least show that they hadn't changed, right? That this was being overlooked. Um, and I kind of gave up. But uh, then this happened. We need to ask ourselves, why is this the case? To address these challenges adequately, we must ask, who is vulnerable? Throughout the world, sex workers and their clients And that little dot is me losing my mind that this actually happened, running around the crowd, waving the thank you sign. <laughs> and so what happened is, this is a 30-second applause break, right? She was in the middle of her sentence and could not continue because people were cheering for her mentioning sex work. People who inject drugs. So, um... This is, uh, after that, actually, many speakers started talking about sex workers, and I later got confirmation that backstage, they were changing their speeches before they came out, right? <laughs> we were able to change the tone of the conference. We um, you know, created this spectacle, a lot of images. This went out in the press. Um, and along with our other actions, we were able to accomplish almost all of the objectives the sex workers set out for the conference. And, uh, okay, I showed this to Mishan earlier. He's seen this, and he was like, you know, I, it's a great project, but it does make me a little bit uncomfortable because you're basically, like, telling people what to say. It's a little manipulative, right? And my answer was yes. Yes, it is. And we are telling people what to say, you know? Um, I am not uncomfortable with that. But there's a lot of people who say, like, you know, this artistic activism thing, you're instrumentalizing art. A lot of art is about freedom for the artists, um, and ugh, like, let them be, right? Um, I had a mentor, Malachias Montoya, who would answer this question. He would say, you know, art has always been propaganda. It's just propaganda for the rich and powerful. But that aside, I think this works with a really outdated idea of what propaganda is. So this is the Shannon and Weaver model of communication, if you'll indulge me. Um, and the idea is that, like, I have a thought, I encode that into speech, it goes out to you, you hear it, you decode it in your mind, and then you have the same thought, right? And if you have a different thought than I'm having, then there's a problem in the communication. Um, the propaganda model, or the Duncombe-Lambert model of uh, propaganda, is, like, you just substitute, insert in propaganda, right? I encode this into a poster or a video, and then at the end, you think the same thing that I think, and that's good. Um, I'd argue that art, when you put art in the middle, it doesn't work the same way, right? So what happens is artists usually have a lot of complex ideas. They focus them into one work, and when they can focus them well, they come out as this rainbow on the other side. And this is 
does, is supposed to look like a prism, right? Um, because what's required here is a really focused and clear intention by the artist in order to get the rainbow on the other side. If you just dump a bunch of light onto a, a prism, you don't get the rainbow, right? So, this is not how propaganda works, though, this, this old model that I showed you. This is a 1930s era model of propaganda. The way that propaganda, um, at least in the US, and I think Russia is the best at this, um, is to present a lot of ideas, right? So in the US, we have very partisan versions of events, of the truth, um, multiple perspectives, conspiracies. We have alternative facts, right? Like we just present a bunch of different things, and you kind of have to pick which ones you think are true. Um, it's more clear in the US than it is in Russia. Uh, a great example in Russia is uh, Malaysia, flight, Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, right? Which was shot down over the Ukraine. Their state media put out like eight different versions of what could have happened, right? Um, the point isn't to get to the truth, it's just to cast doubt. We don't know it's true, right? Um, so modern propaganda's goal is not a singular belief, it's overwhelm and resignation. And it looks like this. So you just have all these different ideas and you swarm the person with them. And the, they can be multiple perspectives, they can be different theories, questions, things that are unverified, um, things that are contradictory. And the ultimate result, the desired outcome is, what are you gonna do? Right, like, who, who knows what happened? And things are kind of corrupt anyway, and I'm just gonna kind of go back to living my life. And who benefits from that, right? The resignation and the hopelessness about the future that just governments are corrupt, people are corrupt, weird things happen. Only the most corrupt benefit from that. Now, I'm not saying we don't need alternative perspectives, and we definitely need to base our work on the truth, but the truth alone is not self-evident. The truth needs help. Just putting out information, just putting it out there, um, telling the truth, presenting another perspective, without connecting it to outcomes and helping people understand the steps along the way to get there, functions a lot like modern propaganda. And so I would argue this is a key difference. The great irony of the fear of being too direct and of creating 1930s era, era propaganda and manip manipulation can be what leads artists and activists to contribute to a much more sophisticated and troubling type of propaganda and misinformation. Our world can be better. And if you're serious about moving to a more open and just society, we're going to take you seriously. There's a lot of victories ahead of us. And it's critical that we do the work together of putting utopia back on the horizon and helping us all take meaningful steps towards it. My name is Steve Lambert. This is how you can find me. I'll be around for the next day or two also. I'm happy to talk to you about this. Again, I can talk about it for four days. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we have another five minutes. If there are any questions, raise your hand and I come to you. No problem. Oh, yeah. First row again. Freelance journalist. Hello. I loved your talk. I got to uh, oops a little bit with the passport thing because Germany has a great problem with people who are denying the government, Reichsbürger. If you heard of them, they have their own passports okay. and they uh, deny the constitution and things like that. Uh, what idea would you have to, f to make artistical uh, things right. <laughs> against the right wing uh, rising in Germany? Just, uh, yeah. It's a dystopia. Okay, so you're, I, I just want to repeat that 
um, you know, in Germany this is different, right? That you have this sort of alternative paperwork or, or uh, alternate paperwork for migrants. Um, right. So uh, the point is that all artistic activism is specific to a, a place, right? It's like a site-specific artwork, um, both to a region and a culture. And this is one of the things that personally drives me crazy about the obsession with tactics in this practice, right? I've worked with the Yes Men. People love the Yes Men. I love the Yes Men, right? But they look at that and they're like, okay, let's do that, right? And that works in a specific context, in a specific time and place. All artistic activism is rooted to the, the when it's successful, it's also rooted to that time and place. And we can't, what works in Texas, I'll tell you, like from having visited these places, what works in Texas does not work in Kenya. And what works in South Africa does not work in Eastern Europe, right? So um, it has to be local. And this is why it's important to, to work in collaboration, right? And to not just sort of send out methods, but to have those methods be generated in those communities. Steve, thank you. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Steve Lambert.